Greetings. How's everyone doing out there? I hope you guys are doing beautiful on what's today, the 25th, right? No, the 20. <laughs> I can't believe I forget what day this is, the 24th. See, that's what happens when you are no longer living in the third dimensional construct is that we begin to um, live without any concept of time. And I did notice that I don't have much lighting here. So uh, if you guys could give me a second, let me go ahead and plug that in. I want to welcome everyone in the house. I have deep gratitude for everyone. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe, make sure you do, because I am competing with my other pirated channels. So it'll help my channel grow if you guys could subscribe as well. And also, um, I did put out the latest video on the five most powerful positive loving entities in the universe. How's everyone doing out there? Yeah, I'm going to get some light here. I don't like the shadow that I see on me. One second. I didn't realize it was so dark in my house and I actually have the light at its fullest capacity. One second. There we go. I think that'll work. But there would be light. And there was light, they said. Well, you know, before there was light, there was three primal sounds, right? Those are currently being developed in the 15th structure of the, uh, I'm sorry, in the cosmic structure of the 15-dimensional time matrix. We do have levels beyond the 15th dimension, but... Today's subject is going to be rather a very, um, another controversial topic. You know, there's a lot of mystery shrouded in the concept of Enoch, the book of Enoch, right? As to why it was one of the books that was left out in the Bible, with the exception, of course, of the Ethiopian Bible. So um, I would like to share with you guys the mysteries surrounding Enoch and why did the Roman Catholic Church... Um, obstructed from getting canonized. But do you remember, guys, that there was a few hundred books that were left behind. Um, among them are books that are associated with the Apocrypha. All right. I want to give a shout out to Cosmic Goddess, Ricky Lee 1111, Gloria Jimenez, um, Chastine Rose. Uh, who else is here? Jamie Levenway, um, Neo. Neil Lemuria. Oh, we have two Neils in the house. Nice. Uh, Justin Mercado is in the house. <laughs> and everyone else who's in the house, shout out to you all, Galactic Jedi. Awesome. I want to welcome everyone. And if I do happen to have some new people that are new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe. And the reason being is because I am competing with some pirated accounts. So make sure that you guys do subscribe. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to share with you guys regarding the book of Enoch, that um, this book is actually divided, divided into several sections, and, it's, um, and it provides a narrative about angels, watchers, and cosmic events. Now, bear in mind also that one of the things that I like to talk about, right, or one of the connections that I've discovered that I've actually shared in my book, Our Cosmic Origin, is the fact that angels... Uh, ETs or pause. Oh, I just saw an orb. I just saw an orb right over here, right there. There you go. There's a, there's another one. See the orbs, the uh, spirits are around me, but uh, angels, um, positive ETs or positive interdimensionals, uh, gods of ancient times, uh, they're all classifying or categorized under the same entities, but under different names. So the term watcher is related to the idea of some sort of celestial group of entities that were in charge of guarding over the earth, all right? And as you guys know, earth is part of a system that belongs to the Alcyone central sun system, the Pleiades, right? There's about a total of 52 different star nations that belong to our cluster in um, division or sector nine, right? The galaxies divide into different sectors. <laughs> so um, as a result of that, we could say that the watchers of old, right? were the, the ones that were left in charge of guarding the human experiment here on this planet or the human race rather, because at that, uh, you know, during those days, there was a huge infiltration by members of the Orion syndicate, which are those that are 
pretty much re uh, related to the idea of service to self, or those are aligned with the expanding draconian empire. So the fact that um, there are two categories of entities, we have the celestials that are descending right from the top down. And I describe this in perfect detail in my book. And then you have the ascending terrestrials. So there, we could say that during the times of Atlantis, there was a coexistence of descending celestials at the same time, uh, Neanderthals or Chroma not Chromagnum, I'm sorry, or Homo erectus, right? The primitives um, that were ascending from the bottom up, right? As they were moving up in the evolutionary ladder. And then, of course, there was a, um, a conglomeration of different uh, star nations that were coming from the Taigeta system, from Lyra, well, you know, refugees from Lyra, of course, from uh, different parts of our universe that were... Um, coexisting in peace during the days of Atlantis. So during the days of Atlantis, we actually had three types of existing humanoids, right? We have the descending humanoids. We had the already existing humanoids that um, had sought refuge here, um, you know, fleeing the galactic wars from different systems that were under the attack of the galactic empire and sought refuge here on this planet, right? And then, of course, we also had the ascending primates, okay? So... Bear in mind that um, there were different types of entities that existed. And, and the reason why I believe that the Orthodox, particularly the Council of Nicaea, right, the bishops of Rome, I believe that the reason they did not accept many of the books in the Bible, in particular the Book of Enoch, which I'm going to go over with today in detail, is because of the fact that the Book of Enoch mentions the Nephilim, the Nephilim, which were the what? They were the, the offspring result of the fallen angels that were prohibited to mix and have intercourse with the daughters of men. Okay, so when you correlate the concept of the fallen angels with the Anunnaki, they are one and the same. Okay, there is a faction of the Anunnaki that fell under the direction of Enki, of course, and then there is the other faction that remained loyal to the law of one and servants in service to others as far as continuing the protection of the original divine Adamic human experiment, okay? So that is the reason why organized religions completely left out the Book of Enoch out of those historic or out of the canon, canonized, canonization process, because of the fact that it alludes to a pre-diluvial world where both giants, humans, celestials, right, the Niberians, the Anunnaki, whatever you want to call them, right, and even within the ranks or within the uh, celestials, you had warring functions, of course. We see this in every ancient manuscript, including the uh, um, the Rig Vedas of the Mahabharata, when it talked about the flying Vimanas and, and the different aerial wars that took place in ancient times, all for the what? All to see, all for the control of the human project, okay? That's the reason why there were fallen angels that were prohibited to have children with the daughters of men. But unfortunately, they did violate cosmic and galactic law. And so these Igigi, right, as translated by the Sumerian tablets, which were heavenly, 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 let me repeat that again, which were heavenly modified by the priesthood of Belial Baal Marduk, who changed all the records, right? Um so basically, the, these these children, these Nephilim, were a curse, a malicious curse to the evolving Adamic humanity, all right? And so because of that, you know, my friends, they didn't want, organized religion did not want us to know about these giants that are, by the way, now waking up, all right? It is believed, according to certain whistleblowers within the secret space program, that a lot of these Nephilim... All right, survive the flood. All right, survive the flood, and some of them are have been they they went into a stasis. In other words, they've been sleeping for a few thousand years. All right, and this was a technology that was given to them by who the leader of the fallen angels, which are the fallen Anunnaki. So again, the terminology fallen angels and the negative Anunnaki are one and the same. The Anunnaki represent the descending celestials from higher dimensions into lower dimensions, and primitive Cro-Magnum represents 
the new soul, right? Which are now the earth Terrans, of course, which is the majority of humans. Okay, so Enoch is also mentioned. He was mentioned briefly in the New Testament, specifically in the ep epistle of Jude, where a prophecy from the book of Enoch is coded. The significance and interpretation of Enoch was among different religious traditions and scholars. Some view Enoch as a righteous figure who had a close relationship with the divine. And this is where I believe the organized religions kind of twisted it around to say that some others consider the book of Enoch as non-canonical and not part of the accepted biblical test because it does not align with God. But what they were truly hiding, what they were truly hiding is the idea that we have, we were once part of an advanced intergalactic civilization on this planet where you had mortals, semi-mortals, you had ascending mortals, right, terrestrials, and different types of humanoids that coexisted uh, simultaneously when the earth was still, what, connected to all the different dimensions. And there was this phenomenon called the cosmic current that used to act as the, as the integration or the connecting mechanism of the 12 dimensions um, that exist here on this planet. And that's probably another reason why our planet is being targeted right now, right? And so heavenly uh, coveted because of the fact that we are the only planet in our universe that harbors the 12 stargates that lead all the way to the what? To the gates of eternity, all right? No other planet has the 12 stargates the way we do. But anyways, that's going to be a whole new different subject. Um, so, yeah, the book of Enoch, among other books, there were actually... Um, in, in the Apocrypha, we also had, um, like, the book of Watchers. We had the book of the parables, the book of astronomy. Believe it or not, Abraham. Abraham was teaching astronomy to the ancient Egyptians. See, the truth of the matter is, is um, unlike the modified version of the Jews, the original the descendants of Abraham were high priest and high priestess, right? They had the equal balance between father God and mother God um, and were alchemists, were, were astronomers. They were um, magicians. They were the Magi, okay? And this is where a lot of the organized Christian uh, traditions um, fail to understand and they even see it as a threat when the truth that their patriarchs, right, from Enoch to Methuselah to Noah to Abraham, and uh, later through, you know, uh, David and Solomon, they were all practicing magicians. They were all part of the righteous priesthood, priesthood of the uh, king lineage that could be traceable all the way to Lyra. And this is why they don't want to accept these other books, because a lot of these other books um, reveal a lot of the mysticism and a lot of the hidden mystery, uh, the ancient mystery school teachings uh, principles, in other words. So the discovery of the Book of Enoch and related texts can be attributed to various individuals and events. So the Book of Enoch itself is a compilation of several works, and different parts may have been written by different authors over time. The primary section of Enoch include the Book of the Watchers, the Book of the Parables, again, the Book of Astronomy, and get this. The book of dream visions, dream visions, the original patriarchs, the authentic biblical patriarchs were actual metaphys metaphysicians, right? They were, you know, mystics, all right? They weren't like we read in the Bible, right? They weren't these servants to, you know, to God. They were actually experiencing the divine through their, through their magic, white magic, of course, that is, because they were also at war with the Babylonian Brotherhood, right? The descendants of Nimrod who were practitioners of dark magic, okay? Let me get in the center here. So, um, I can't wait for all this information to be revealed. All right, so the Book of Enoch was known to early Jewish and Christian communities, but it fell out of favor in mainstream religious traditions. We all know that. Uh, it co And copies were lost and forgotten. The situation changed in the 18th and 19th century when several manuscripts of Enoch were rediscovered. One of the significant discoveries was made by James Bruce, a Scottish traveler who obtained several Ethiopian manuscripts, the 
the actually the church of, of Ethiopia was the only church, guys, that preserved and included the key the book of Enoch. Out of all the different, you know, hundreds of Christian uh, organizations, the Ethiopian text kept the book, which was awesome. Okay. Um, where the book of Enoch was preserved in the Ethiopian Orthodox Taha. Tawahidu Church. <laughs> Another crucial discoverer occurred in the 19th century when various manuscripts of Enoch were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qunram Caves near the Dead Sea. Well, if you guys um, are familiar with the community of Quran, the Essene secret brotherhood and sisterhood of the pure ones, right? Which is another benevolent. The word benevolent, for those that don't know, is another a positive secret society or another righteous secret society um, that isolated themselves during the days when the Roman Empire, which is the fourth beast, right? The fourth beast, the overt attempt of world domination, the fourth beast. <laughs> um, they secluded themselves from the rest of the world that was controlled by the fourth beast, in other words. So in order for them to continue the inner teaching traditions of what? Of mysticism, of alchemy, of astrology. Um, of divination, all of that, which again could be traceable all the way to the 12 sons of um, Abraham, which some people believe it's symbolic to refer to as the 12 zodiacs. Um, regardless, you know, we do know that the original descendants of Abraham or, you know, David, Solomon, going back to Abraham and Noah, um, actually carried the highest concentration of Adamic bloodline, of angelic Adamic bloodline. All right, the original line that Enki was trying to uh, corrupt. All right, so so <clears throat> these scrolls went back to the Second Temple period and provided scholars with ancient Hebrew and Aramaic versions of some sections of the Book of Enoch. So the discovery of the Book of Enoch is attributed to the efforts of individuals like James Bruce and the archaeological findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Another uh, beautiful relic that was discovered in the Nag Hammadi Caves were the Dead Sea Scrolls. Again, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls is another living testament to the fact that in ancient times and even up until you know uh, the communities that were produced by the Knights Templars and the Cathars of France and the Troubadours of Spain, um, they were all part of this ancient spiritual tradition, right? A lot of this information has been excavated as the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? The Dead Sea Scrolls, I think, came into the limelight about 15, maybe 15 to 20 years ago. So that's another an, another set of manuscripts um, that totally validate and confirm the uncanonized or unaccepted books of the Bible. So the, the rediscovery of the Book of Enoch is attributed to the efforts of individuals like James Bruce and the archaeological findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. These discoveries have allowed scholars to study and analyze the content of Enoch and its significance in ancient Jewish and early Christian literature. All right, so let's get to some deep, deep mysteries about Enoch. Um, you know, there is... A belief, right, that uh, Enoch was the incarnated Metatron, Archangel Metatron, um, and later when he was transfigured, as he was righteous and he walked with God, he trans he was transfigured from a mortal to an immortal, right, and he ascended to become again the Archangel Metatron. Okay, so with that in mind, let's read about. Okay, let's read about the Book of the Watchers. Okay, because the Book of the Watchers goes hand in hand with the book of Enoch. Again, these are manuscripts that were deliberately left out by Rome in order to what? In order to conceal our ancient the truth about our ancient past, right? That, you know, there was an advanced civilization that existed prior to the fall of full consciousness into limited consciousness. Okay, so here is a brief excerpt from the Book of Enoch, specifically from the section known as the Book of the Watchers. Let me see. There we go. That way I'm in the center. So it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days was born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heavens. Okay, again, the descending celestials, right? Angels, gods, they're all one and the same. 
Anunnaki's, they were the Niberians, okay? The ones that were left in charge to guard over our system, all right? So not only were they in charge of Earth, but they were in charge of anywhere from 600 to about 1,000 worlds, okay, which make up our system. Our system is comprised of almost 1,000 worlds. So, and it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heavens, saw and lusted after them. And said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. This passage introduces a narrative of angels referred to as the Watchers, descending to earth from planet Nibiru. Of course, they don't talk about that here. Uh, lusting after human women and taking them as wives, leading to the birth of hybrid beings, which explains the negative, carnivorous, human flesh-eating giants. That had to be eliminated. All right. There was a reason why Enlil, Zeus, Jupiter, whatever you want to call him, there was a reason why he sent the flood, because he he was ordered by the High Council of Sirius B to end the degenerative, mutative, uh, you know, hybrid programs that were conducted by Enki, and most importantly, to end the existence of those biblical giants, the Nephilim, who were again eating humans and causing wracking havoc across the earth. Uh, you know, being extremely wicked. So everything has a reason. Of course, everybody, not everybody, but most people in the disclosure community want to point at Enlil as the bad guys for, for sending the flood, saying that the humans were making too much noise and everything, and that was never the case. The truth is that Enlil had to wipe out the abominations that were not part of the original div Adamic divine blueprint. All right? Um Anyway, so the passage includes the narrative of angels referred to as the watchers descending to earth, lusting after human women and taking them as wives, leading to the birth of hybrid children. The book of Enoch goes on to describe the consequences of these actions and includes Enoch's visions, teachings and revelations. In the book of Enoch, the watchers are a group of angels who are sent to earth to watch over humanity. However, they become captivated by the beauty of human women and ultimately rebel against their divine responsibilities. So this is where they defy the Council of Nibiru, which back then, before it was taken over by Marduk, was under the direction of the Syrian High Council, who is the primary governing body of the entire Galactic Alliance and the Galactic Senate and all those different councils. You know, the Council of Nine, the Council of 24, the Council of Five, the Council of Twelve. Um, guys, attend my presentation at the Conscious Life Expo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break down all these different councils, the different commanders within these councils, and it's gonna go deep. It's gonna go really deep. Um, for those that are attending my my workshop, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go deep. Okay, so the Watchers, led by figures like, oh, check this out. All right, this is another connection to Marduk. All right, so the the Bible changed Marduk, Marduk's name to Samjasa. Remember Samjasa? was the one who was in charge of the fallen angels that, you know, had intercourse with women on earth. Um, Samjasa spelled S-E-M-J-A-Z-A. -A. So, so the watchers, led by a figure named Samjasa, who, by the way, was Marduk, right? As I described in my book, Marduk was the leader of the fallen angelics, so of the fallen Niberians, of the fallen Anunnaki's. Of, of uh, And he even managed to convince some of the Pleiadians or, or human galactics to join him. So that's why we have some um, what we call renegade Pleiadians, right? We have some renegade Syrians, all right? It, 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 you know, he was um, – the fallen angelics, it, it, was, it wasn't just draconians or greys. It consisted of fallen hu galactic humans that also were once part of the, you know, the Guardian Alliance and decided to defect against good in order to join Marduk in the dominance and conquest of planet Earth. So I just wanted to point that out, guys. Um, okay, so, and some Jessa, who was their leader. Okay, every time I say some Jessa, just think Marduk. And some Jessa of Marduk, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered to him and said, let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. All right. So that's what we called 
uh, another, you know, in, 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 and as an extension, I'm sorry, to the fallen, you know, to the Luciferian rebellion, this was the second rebellion. We could say with this, when the angels that were the watchers that were in charge of what protecting our earth, uh, a, a good group of them decided to follow some Jesa. Some Jesa was Marduk, the son of Enki. All right. So I just want to make that, you know, that correlation there. So um, this passage describes some Jesa of Marduk expressing concern about the consequences of their actions and the other watchers agreeing to bind themselves by an oath to proceed with their plans to take human wives. I don't know about you um, females out there, but you know, some of these hideous looking Anunnaki's did not look all that handsome. So I don't know if they camouflage themselves. I don't know if it was because they um, told them if, if you mate with me, I will teach you the art of magic. Cause I, I did read in some other manuscripts that some of these fallen angels that follow some Jaysa, um, taught women, you know, incantations, um, uh, amul you know, uh, the, the, the concept of using amulets to attract man, uh, po potions, uh, in other words, witchcraft. So in some cases, I do believe that some of these earth women, uh, were pretty much manipulated by some Jesa and his followers, right? Those that were forbidden to mate with men, with the daughters of men, uh, were pretty much manipulated by them in order to, you know, because they were receiving in turn uh, knowledge of the arts of necromancy, which is what? Which is sorcery, okay? So I just wanted to point that out. So there, there was some sort of mutual agreement that took place rather between the earth females and the fallen Anunnaki angels, whatever you want to call them. And of course, you know, we do know that um, the henchmen of Marduk, right? All those renegade extraterrestrials that joined Marduk in his quest for world domination when he corrupted and, and uh, infiltrated Atlantis. But well, we, we do know that what do they do? Um, they completely introduced the arts of sorcery to evolving humans who were not ready consciously or spiritually to understand, you know, the arts of black magic and sorcery, among other things that they taught humans, which was what? They introduced them to advanced technological weapons, right? When they were totally immature spiritually. It's like when you introduce a young race advanced technological weapons say here let me, here here's the plutonium bomb here's the atom bomb and these guys are still barbaric okay we're talking about the evolving men's it's it's likened to giving a, a, a two-year-old child matches and a lighter uh not a lighter but you know what i mean you know matches yeah matches and a lighter and say or no i'm sorry matches and dynamite stick and a dynamite stick or a lighter and a dynamite stick and saying here play with it it's like you know it's equivalent to that. That's what I'm trying to say. You don't give a, a two-year-old or a toddler a dynamite stick and a lighter and say, here, play with it. So that's a, a metaphor to describe um, what happened um, during the times of Atlantis. Okay, so these passages describe Sinjessa expressing concern about the consequences of their actions. The watchers agreeing to bind themselves by an oath to proceed with their plan to take human wives. The narrative opens on to the details that the, the details, the consequences of the watcher's actions, including the birth of the Nephilim. OK, so that was the hybrid children that resulted as a result of the watchers that were fallen angelics who made it with the daughters of men. So and the corruption of humanity leading to divine judgment. And I believe that what that entails when it says leading to divine judgment was when the High Council of Sirius, in an effort to preserve the original human experiment, the divine experiment, um, ordered Enlil, Seuss, whatever you want to call him, to send the flood. Okay. And of course, we do know that Noah, um, despite of what the Sumerian tablets have said he was actually the son of Enlil, not the son of Enki. Uh, I wanted to make that uh, that uh, I wanted to point the facts that you know that fact that Noah was actually the son of Enlil, not the son of Enki. Okay, because Noah was full humanoid; he had no reptilian in him, and that's the reason why um, Zeus Enlil saw favor in him because he was the only one that contained the original divine Adamic uh, blueprint within his genetics. 
So it, everything has purpose, guys. Everything that we read in the Old Testament, there's a reason why, you know. It, it was really the battle between um, the positive Niberians and the, and the fallen Niberians, you know. And, of course, we humans became their, like, their pawns, you know, uh, which translated in the 3D realm as the battle between ancient the ancient Hebrews and the Babylonians, right? <laughs> and today we know that the Babylonians hij hi has have hijacked the term Israel and, you know, Jews, and they call themselves the Zionists, right? Uh, proclaiming to be the descendants of King David, when in actuality, they're actually the descendants of who? Of Nimrod, of Nimrod. Okay. So the story of the Watchers in the book of Enoch is unique to this text and is not present in the canonical scriptures of most religious traditions. It offers a perspective. It offers a perspective to the origins of evil and the fall of certain angels, diverging from the accounts found in the Bible. All right, now let's learn about how, according to the secret esoteric interpretation of what who Enoch was, he was a fractal of the descending Metatron. All right. I did put out my video today, by the way, the five top most powerful entities of the light, all right? Uh, and, and Metatron is second to Prime Creator Source. Again, Prime Creator Source is more of a nurturing womb, right? Giving birth to Metatron. Uh, Metatron, in turn, providing the outer life circuits for the Creator sons and daughters of light, believe it or not. Every Creator son and daughter of light, are they come in pairs. Michael has faith, or Michelle. Um, Gabriel has hope, uh, Raphael has, uh, Christine, and then you have mother Mary, Kuan Yim. I should, I should do a, a whole, whole series on the, the 10 top, uh, powerful divine feminines too, right? Cause uh, I know I should, cause they do come in pairs by the way. So there is a balance there. So the transformation of Enoch into the angel Metatron is not explicitly mentioned in traditional canonical scriptures, but it is a concept found in certain Jewish mystical and esoteric traditions, particularly within Kabbalah. And I do want to make another distinction, guys. There is a difference between Kabbalah and Kabbal. The Kabbalah was the secret, the ancient secret mystery school teachings or the knowledge of their, of them, of that, I'm sorry, that was preserved by Moses in the form of the Kabbalah. So you have uh, different books uh, that uh, arose as a result of that. So that is not uh, needless to say that the cabal throughout the centuries, right? Whenever they go and they study these works, they try to corrupt certain things and they always invert things. So that is called the inversion process, right? So we do know that the swastika, which represents the four quadrants of the universe, the four directions, uh, the four aspects of our being, mind, emotion, body, spirit, um, was also corrupted by the Nazis and used as, as a symbol of power. Well, everything in history, the Star of David has been corrupted, right? Um, everything in history, guys, has been inverted by the Cabal, all right? So that's why we have to have that discernment as well. So um, the Jewish, so yeah, so therefore the Kabbalah was not in its original compilation by Moses, who, by the way, was the Pharaoh Akhenaten, <laughs> See, there's an, another another correlation there, right? This is where history begins to merge somehow, right? All these traditions um, begin to merge when you go back to ancient times, right? The name of Noah was Sisudra, right? Also Adna Pashtin. Adna Pashtin was the Sumerian name of Noah. To the ancient Indians, right? Because every every ancient account talks about the flood. They called him Sisudra. So you have Noah to the west, right? That's what we know him as. You have Adna Pashtin, Adna Pashtin, Utna Pashtin, if I could pronounce it right. And then you had Sisudra. Okay, so Metatron is considered one of the highest angels and is often associated with divine secrets and mystical knowledge. That is so true because Enoch wrote a lot of information regarding mysticism. And also to do another dis um, distinguished, how can I say that? Uh, another distinction between Enoch and Hermes. E Enoch and Hermes, I'm sorry, Enoch and uh, Thoth. Enoch and Thoth were two different entities, okay? Thoth was the son of Enki. Enoch was of the lineage of Enlil Sus, okay? So those are two different entities. One of them was righteous, which was Enoch, and the other one 
uh, defected from you know the the old priesthood and became part of the dark arts. Okay, and that was known as Thoth. Um, anyway, so the idea of Enoch's transformation into Metatron is derived from interpretations and and elaborations on Enochian traditions found in texts like the Third Book of Enoch, also known as the Sefar Hekalat, the Book of Palaces, or the Book of Heavenly Mansions. In chapter 3 of the Book of Enoch, it is said to have undergone a celestial transformation, becoming an angel Metatron, and being granted a high rank in the celestial hierarchy. All right, so according to this book, Enoch mentions about his, what, his transformation, his translation from the flesh, from being immortal to an immortal, to a celestial, uh, and taking his place in the divine hierarchy. So again, the editors of the canon law in Nicaea, right, Rome, did not want us to know that. They didn't want us to know that there is, that we are capable of transforming. We are capable of becoming immortal, all right? It is within our genetics, okay? So in this text, Metatron is described as a heavenly scribe, an angelic being with immense knowledge and authority, sometimes serving as a mediator between God and the other angels. The transformation of Enoch into Metatron is seen as a form of divine exaltation and a way for Enoch to contribute its righteous existence in a celestial capacity. All right, so I'm starting to speculate something, guys. And, and also, if you guys want to you know, elaborate on this. I'm starting to think that Thoth, the Atlantean, who, again, corrupted the CDT um, information of the Emerald Tablets, the original Emerald uh, records, the CDT plates, not the tablets, okay, um, just wanted to replace the work of Enoch. I have a feeling that Enoch, that there's some sort of like overlay there between Thoth and Enoch, all right? And this is the reason why uh, some people within this community would say that they're one and the same and that they're also it's also Hermes, right? According to the Greeks, he was known as Hermes Trismegistus. I'm starting to believe that, that Hermes perhaps could have been Enoch, but Thoth was, was a totally different entity, right? Thoth was the one who corrupted the original divine ancient records, and Enoch was the one who preserved the original knowledge, but uh, of course because of the Babylonian priesthood and brotherhood that took place, right? The ancient cabal, um, they completely eliminated the name of Enoch and gave all the credit to who? To Thoth. Think about that. I just I just made that correlation right now, okay? Because it seems like there's, there's a lot of correspondences between a lot of the activities that Enoch or a lot of the, you know, uh, attributes or qualities um, that describe his life as to that of Thoth. You know, he was... A mediator between you know the gods and the mortals he was a messenger right he was a facilitator of higher esoteric divine knowledge um they both had all of those titles so i'm starting to think that enoch was was completely eliminated in a sense where they took away his name and replaced it with thoth all right when it comes to what to the her hermetic teachings when it comes to the mystical knowledge. So I think that they wanted to give the cabal, they wanted to give all the credit to Thoth, who was the son of Enki. And I do believe that Hermes, Hermes was actually the son of who? Hermes comes from the line of Zeus, the Greek god, which is Enlil. And um, so I think, perhaps, I think that Hermes, Trismegistus, and Enoch are the same entity. All right, so that's, that's my opinion. You guys are free to brainstorm and, um, you know, tell me what you think in the comments. Um, okay, so, so it is important to note that these concepts are part of a mystical tradition and are not universally accepted in all branches of Judaism or Christianity. Different religious communities have various views on the status and role of angels and interpretations of Enoch's transformation into Metatron may offer among scholars and believers. That's interesting. So the transformation of Enoch into Metatron is not explicitly mentioned in the traditional book of Enoch. Instead, it is a concept that appears in later Jewish mystical and esoteric 
traditions, particularly in texts like the third book of Enoch, or it's also known as the Sefar Hakalat, the Sefar Hakalak, which is a separate work from the main book of Enoch. So these are accounts of Enoch's transformation into the angel Metatron. And this is a work that is part of the broader mystical and Kabbalistic traditions. It describes Metatron's elevated status in the celestial hierarchy and his role as a heavenly scribe and mediator. So while the traditional book of Enoch does not certain this specific transformative narrative, the concept is present in later mystical texts that have been, excuse me, that have been influential in certain strands of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. That was interesting. So, so yes, um, there were, I believe there were over 700, 700 books that were completely left out of the Bible when the Bible was put together, compiled by the bishops of Rome. And I am starting to, well, I've kind of always known this, but I want to share this with you guys because of the fact that they wanted to conceal the, the fact or, or, or the idea that we were a multidimensional existence, that there were other worlds, right? Visitors have always existed, visitors from different realms, from different planets um, that were all that existed at one point on this planet. Um, they wanted to hide the fact that um, there is such thing as a descending race and an ascending race and everything in between. Uh, what else do they wanted to hide? They wanted to hide the fact that we were all directly connected to the divine, right? That's why organized religion came into existence to kind of separate every single one of you or every single one of us from our own divine connection to God's source, which is what we are at the highest level. You know, when you think about it, guys, what is ascension? Ascension is integration, right? And I mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. All right. So I was informed that there are actually 12 souls that when we go into the fifth dimension, 12 souls that are personalities on the third dimension actually collapse into a, you know, into a greater being. Okay. Or how, how it was informed, how I was informed is that there's 12 personalities. I'm sorry. In the three of you, there's 12 personalities. Okay. That collapse into a soul in the 50. All right. And that's what we are in the 50. We are uh, an integration of 11 different versions of ourselves. And these versions of ourselves are not necessarily in this time in, in this reality or in this uh, version of the earth, but in alternative versions of the earth, right? In parallel realities. So if you guys could bear with me, this is a mind bender, okay? So what happens is when we ascend into the fifth dimension, all the different other alternative third dimensional realms or earths that coexist with this one begin to merge, okay? Because that's what ascension is. It's the integration process of the many, the different factorizations going back to the one, okay? So as we ascend to the fifth dimension, we're actually going to be integrating with 11 other versions of ourselves that exist in alternative parallel Earths, all right? Keep keep with me here. And then once we go into the fifth dimension, we become a soul, all right? And then in the fifth dimension, we're going to also integrate 11 other versions of ourselves and other alternative realities that are also existing in other fifth dimensional worlds and integrate into what? Into an avatar in the eighth dimension. Okay. And as we go beyond the eighth dimension, or as we move beyond the eighth dimension, I guess that's right. During the eighth dimension, there's also 11 other versions of ourselves in other parallel eighth dimensional realities. And then so we begin to integrate those to then become what? The monad in the 12th dimension. The monad is really our God self. Okay. That's when we are the accumulation, the amalgamation of all of our ancestors and all of our progeny in one big oversoul. Okay, and then after the monad, of course, you have the oversoul because there are 11 other monads in the 12th dimension that integrate as we move up into the what? Into the 15th dimension. Once we reach the 15th dimension, which is the realms of eternity, right? It begins with dimensions 13, 14, but 15 is where it's at. Uh, we begin to become, the, now we become back to, we integrate everything back to one. And then that's when we are uh, one with the universal mind of prime creator source. There is no division. There is no separation. Once we reach to that level, guys, there is no more integration. In other words, we've already, you know, we have become one. 
Okay. And that's why everything in existence is, is interconnected and everything is one because it, it's, it's all, um, in a way experiencing different. It's like one consciousness, bear with me. It's one consciousness experiencing itself through trillions and trillions of fractals. So eventually those fractals have to reintegrate back into the one consciousness. And that one consciousness is prime creator source. So that means that each and every single one of you guys is me and I am you with different, you know, uh, personalities, with uh, different uh, beliefs, different expressions, different attributes, different characteristics. But eventually we begin to integrate those into just one big oversoul, right? That's awesome. <laughs> so that's why we are all one. We are all one. And this is the beauty, guys, that even once we integrate, into becoming one with prime creator source, right? Where all of us, all the trillions of souls are back as one unified soul. Even then, we're all going to remember it because we're all going to retain our individual experiences during the process of the ascension or during the ascension process. That's the beauty of it all. So that is the reason why prime creator source through the trillions upon quadrillions of fractals that it divided itself in is able to process information at an infinite amount of, of, of simultaneously, spontaneously, I mean, spontaneously, all at one time and in one, in one single moment of expressing itself. Um, <laughs> so if you guys have any questions for me, lay them on me. I wanted to thank everyone for being here. If we have, uh, 675, I think, 675 people in the house. Welcome, welcome. Let me put my glasses on. One second. Okay. Therefore, I could see now. Okay, so I'm going to actually take questions from my phone. How is everyone doing out there? Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Hey guys, so Oops, I forgot to turn so down my phone. I apologize for that. All right, so I'm just going to take questions, random questions. I want to welcome Kim Thompson in the house. Shout out to Kim Thompson. Joanna. Who else is here? Ingrid Mendes. Claudio Jerez. Uh, Layla Maucha, David Pax or Pinkston, David Pinkston, Gloria Jimenez. Who else is in the house? Dan Hudson. Welcome, welcome. Chastine Rose, Edward Carsagen, Carsagen, Edward Carsagen. Uh, Dale Ellis, Radiant Guardians. To name a few, Sylvia Foster, Michelle Gosnell, Shelby. Mama Chi in the house. Who else is in the house? Linda Wong. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, Andromeda Daisy, Vanessa, the list goes on. Thank you guys for being here. I just wanted to acknowledge some of you guys out there. All right. So the first question is, uh, so the first super chat came in. All right. I'll start with that one from Just Jay. Thank you so much for being here. What is the difference between a magician, a sorcerer, and a witch? That is a very good question. And there is a significant difference, by the way. So to answer the first part, let me read the second part. Is there such a thing as white witchcraft? Okay. Also, what does it mean when magic is spelled with K at the end? Magic. Okay. Um, interesting. Okay. So the difference is this. Okay. So throughout all of history, right, we have duality. We have the light. We have the dark. So that means that in ancient times, there were these um mediators between the celestials between the gods right as we know as the angels the niberians the galactic watchers whatever you want to call them they're all one and the same and the evolving humans so the mediators as in the case of gandalf right in lord of the rings he's an example and the other four guardians of the earth right you had like four other guardians um they what they do is they they use the the sacred divine knowledge right through their uh, their inner technology, again, a lot of this boils down to the inner technology. That's the the, the underlying source of magic, um, and they begin to yield 
the in control of the elemental forces for good. All right. So the white magicians use the same power we all have, right? Because we all have, we're all psychic. We all have telekinesis, believe it or not. We we all have amazing extrasensory perception abilities beyond. Okay. That's just scratching the surface. So the white magicians are the ones that, that tap into those abilities, right? By reaching higher levels of consciousness, right? Um, for good. Those are the white magicians. The dark magicians are the ones that use the same knowledge, right? They yield the power of the elements. They control the universal life currents through their energy bodies, right? Because that's another feature that the magicians are very good at. They are no longer operating with physical bodies, even though they appear to be physical, but they're mainly using their energetic bodies to remote view, to affect from a distance, to affect anybody, right? So you could either use this for good or evil because, and, and one of the things that they know, one of the things that the magicians have always known is the unified field, quantum physics, the quantum field, right? They've always understood how reality could be changed, manipulated by what? By interfacing with the quantum field. All right. So they use it for good for those that are of the light. For those that are of darkness, they use that same ability for evil, which is their ability to what? To manipulate the quantum realm in order to affect reality at a third dimension or at a physical level, in other words. So witchcraft is... Okay, so witchcraft, throughout the Dark Ages, remember, the, the Catholic Church was burning women that were healers, that were mystics, that were, you know, mediums, that um, had these abilities. They were burning them and calling them witches, okay? So the terminology witch could be used for both again. So you have your white magician, like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. And then you have your dark magician, like that guy, uh, whatever, Solman, Solman, whoever he was, right? The guy that fell to the dark side. Um, in like matter, you have your white witch, right? You have your white witch who uses the herbs of the earth to create natural healing remedies, uh, who uses her medianship talents to uh, create harmony between the spirit realm and the physical realm, right? Or as a mediator, as a channel or between those two realms, who uses her abilities to heal, to um, generate uh, the living, you know, consciousness, to, to merge and generate with the living consciousness of the earth. That is the difference between a white witch and a dark witch. Now, a dark witch does the opposite, right? She uses the same abilities, her psychic powers, her mediumship, her ability to remote view, astral project, whatever, and she uses it for evil, for self-serving gains. Oh, and there you go. That's another distinction. The ones, the, the white magicians, which are always associated with the Melchizedek priesthood, right? Um, there are into, they have the mentality of service to others. That's another distinction. The dark magicians or the sorcerers, right? The sorcerers have the mentality of service to self. So, yes, there is a big difference between the ma magicians, witchcraft, and sorcery. Now, I would say that sorcery, is a little bit, it's a level above witchcraft. Now, sorcery is is people with real powers, like people that could literally bilocate, uh, people that could literally cause you to have an illusion and see things that are not there. Though, so, so sorcerers are really advanced magicians, you could say, right? So it starts off, they start off as ma magicians and then they escalate or they, as they continue to expand and evolve in their powers, then they graduate to the level of sorcerer. But don't get me wrong, you have both types of sorcerers, right? You have, actually, no, this is where the term wizard comes into play. So the sorcerers are typically known to be dark, high-level magicians, whereas the wizards, the wizards are the good guys, okay? So that's the difference. The wizards are, like, the good sorcerers, right? And the sorcerers would be, like, the bad wizards. I don't know if that makes any sense. And uh, your second part of the question is, uh, why is magic spelled with the K at the end? You know, that's just a matter of interpretation. That's just a matter of interpretation. There's really no significance to, you know, whether it's spelled with the K or not.
All right, so this is a good question from Connie Tate. Connie Tate is in the house. How are you doing, Connie? Thank you for being here. Are we ascending to 5D soon, and when does this occur? Will we receive new light energy bodies? Also, Markaba means light energy bodies. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, the light bodies, again, the light bodies are already there existing in the fifth dimension. So let me just remind you guys that you're all multidimensional, all right? So you have you are more than just your physical body. You have an astral body that exists in the fourth dimension, and then you have a light body that exists in the fifth dimension, and then there's different levels of the light body beyond the fifth dimension. So those subtle bodies, which are a total of 12, because they correspond to the 12 dimensions that our universe exists in. Again, the Earth is the only planet that has the 12 stargates, right? <laughs> That's why it's so distinct. But you, those bodies are already there. All you have to do is begin to integrate with them. So, yes, as some of us who are going to be the first portals to open up, um, we are going to trigger, right, the different waves of activations. And then that, in turn, is going to trigger the great solar flush, but I'm starting to believe that it's like the chicken and the egg. I think the solar flash and those that activate first are going to happen. It's going to happen at the same time. I think it's going to be a simultaneous event because bear in mind that there is a constant communication between our cells, our bodies and the scholar gamma ray frequencies, which is also cosmic intelligence coming from the galactic core. So there is some sort of a, of a, of a relationship that has already been formed and developed between our cells, our organs, our, our bodies, our bodies are living, right? Our, our cells are living in individual, uh, individualized micro versions of you. Our organs are conscious, right? Our body is conscious, by the way, guys. It's not just flesh. It's, it's conscious. Every organ is conscious, by the way. Do you guys ever talk to your organs? Maybe you should, okay? But the whole point is that there is this constant communication taking place between our bodies and the scholar gamma ray frequencies. It's They're already... Uh, communicating. So I think it's going to happen simultaneous. All right. Simultaneous. And then the second part of your question is, so yeah, so we already, if, oh yeah, you want to know if we're going to ascend uh, soon. And the answer to that is yes. Yes. Right now we are very close to the mass, to the great event, right? The great solar flash. We are very, very close. And yes, for those that doubt this prophecy, um, every ancient culture, right? including the Lakota tribe, uh, as well as the uh, ancient Aztecs, I'm sorry, the ancient Mayans, they all talk about the fifth world, how the fifth world will be triggered by some sort of sun blast, a blast that is coming from the sun. So every ancient culture, not to mention in Sorostranism is also mentioned, the great solar flash, um, according to the ancient um, in Hindus. The Rig Vedas also talk about the solar flash. So it is mentioned in many, many ancient traditions. So you're asking, when will we ascend? I don't know the day. I don't know the time. But I feel that it's going to happen sometime this year. All right? That is my hope because that's the vision that I was getting, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So we'll see. Okay? Let's all keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> I am ready to go beyond just human 2.0. I want to go into... A human 3.0, but without emerging with technology, there is a difference. Again, <laughs> human 3.0, that's us using our full deck again, our full capacity. All right, so we do have a super chat from Stuart Williams. Thank you so much for being here, brother. And your question is, you've answered all my questions. Thanks, Ishmael. Oh, you're welcome, Stuart. You're welcome. <sighs> Yes, Edward Kasarjan is saying wizards, mystics. That's right. You know, as mystics, right, as spiritually adepts on the path of enlightenment and illumination, right, as we awaken into our immortal status, in a way, we are all magicians, guys. We are all wizards, okay? But we're not sorcerers, okay? Those are two different terminologies. I hope I don't have any sorcerers here. <laughs> but even if I do, we want to transmute you back into the light. <laughs> Let's see. 
So David Pinkston is asking me if I believe in karma. Of course I do. It is a cosmic universal principle. It is a law. Um, and so how do you decree? How about a medit? Oops. I lost your question, brother. I think you were alluding to a, uh, how about a meditation at the end of this life? Absolutely, brother. And um, yes, I do believe, I do believe in karma. I do believe that what you do ultimately comes back to you. So again, this is something that is uh, taught in all ancient mystery school teachings, secret societies, both of the Cabal and of the Order of Melchizedek. Um, but in the Cabal, they always manage to go to like, you know, circumnavigate it as much as they can. And, but they also know, right? See, that's the thing about when it comes to these universal principles, the dark side, they don't abide by these concepts. The light side, the wizards, the mystics, right? The Gandalfs, they do. They abide by these principles and they uphold them, all right? So there is another uh, distinction there between the sorcerers and the wizards. The sorcerers are always breaking cosmic laws, whereas the wizards are always abiding by them in service to others. We have Gloria Jimenez in the house. Hey, brother, don't forget from Sister Cosmic Goddess. She has a good question. Where is Sister Cosmic Goddess? Let me try to find Sister Cosmic Goddess. I want to welcome everyone, all 682 people in the house. Thank you guys for spending your Wednesday night with me. Cosmic Goddess, let me see. What is your question? Hmm. I can't find the question, Cosmic Goddess. Do you mind retyping it? Oh, there it is. I found it. Okay. Oh, thank you for your donation. Your question is, greetings, Ishmael. Why is Billy Carson putting books and information out there that Enki and Thought are the good guys? You know, I asked myself the same question. Um, don't get me wrong, guys. That guy is a true scholar. Uh, I respect him. That guy's done his own research, his own homework, and with a critical mind. But, however, um, he took face value, the ancient S Sumerian tablets, right? Um, you know, the uh, the Eli uh, Luma Elish, right? Um, the Book of Creation, uh, to name a few of the, of the ancient Sumerian tablets. So what he did is he took those face value without questioning anything. Because remember, um, those tablets were tampered with by... Enki's son Marduk, when he flipped everything around to make Enlil look like the good, like the bad guy, and Enki look like the good guy. So I just I don't understand why he never questioned the general narrative, right? The accepted narrative of the ancient Sumerian tablets. So he's just going according to those tablets. That's it. You know, I don't blame the guy. He means no harm, right? You know, he's not under the control of Anki, at least I don't think so, because the guy's awesome. You know, the guy's brought a lot of knowledge to the world. You know, um, I actually admire him. I, I wouldn't mind doing a live with him or perhaps being on a panel with him where we could just, you know, collaborate, change, exchanging ideas and knowledge together. That would be awesome. So I do love him um, as a researcher and as a very knowledgeable um, person. But I just don't understand why he never questioned the the accepted version of the Sumerian tablets. You know, that's that's it. That's I don't understand why he never questioned it. So he's just, again, he's just going by what the accounts revealed, right? The book of Anki, right? Whatever happened to the book of Enlil? See, that's another indicator, right? That everything was flipped. They completely tried to eliminate all the writings of Enlil Seuss, and they only left the writings of Anki. The Book of Eridu, you know, um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's another manuscript that was corrupted. All of those ancient manuscripts, which, by the way, um, the Old Testament, the Book of Genesis draws from, right? They were just consolidated. Uh, and that's why I've, I've always believed that, you know, the Bible is just another, you know, uh, edited version of the ancient texts. So the whole point is this. Yeah, a lot of these people in the community, in the disclosure community, that are saying Enki and Thoth are the good ones, um, a lot of them are just unaware. They're, they're just going according 
to the narrative that was left, uh, that was modified by Marduk in ancient Babylonian times. So that's the best way to answer that. But that's a very good question. Gloria Jimenez is in the house. How are you doing, sister? Thank you for your donation. And your question is, hey, brother, just wanted to say thank you so much for your knowledge. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Gloria. You are so welcome, sister. Again, guys, you know, I'm just a researcher. I'm just a transmitter by connecting with different versions of myself. So all credit goes to God. You know, I draw from the infinite mind of God, you know, little, little uh, pebbles, little pebbles of knowledge, <laughs> right, compared to the vastness of, of, of knowledge that exists. So I'm just an instrument, just like each and every single one of you guys is, you know, just like Billy Carson is. Um, just like um, everyone else out there in this field that is sharing knowledge, you know. So we're just instruments. But, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's going to be a huge shock among all of these people, these, these metaphysical New Age scholars, whatever you want to call them. There's going to be a shock when the truth comes out about how everything was inverted in the in the ancient Sumerian, you know, literatures. So a lot of people are going to be shocked when the truth, you know, when the truth finally comes out. So it's it's going to be interesting the way it unfolds, you know. Uh let's see. Any other questions? I want to welcome all 745 people in the house. All right, so Sonja, Sonja D. Clerk is asking me, when will we start receiving our superpowers? Very, very soon. You know, even that was prophesied about according to the original prophecies, not the ones that we read about in religion texts, but according to the original prophecies, they talked about a time where uh, from uh, the already existing human race, millions would mutate and, be and become the next stage of human evolution. In other words, they would be superhuman. Super with superpowers, which is very similar to X-Men, right? The mutating gene. Why did you think they call them mutants, right? All Marvel does is he takes real information from esoteric secret knowledge and then just rewrite it in their own words. So there is a mutating gene taking place within our genetic structure. Well, in our situation, what's happening due to the infusion of the other 10 strands of DNA is we are activating genes that are currently inactive, I guess, in our case. And then um, we do have another super chat from Ricky Lee. Thank you, brother. His question is, what is the great Pope's purpose? So you're probably talking about, I don't want to say his first name, Orsini, right? The Orsini family. All right. So when it comes to the cabal, you know, you have, yes, you have the Club of Rome, which are all extensions, right? The UN, NATO, uh, the Bilderberger, Tridal Commission, you know, um, Skulls and Bones, um, Council of Foreign Relations, Royal Institute of International Affairs. They're all, okay, so that's an outer vehicle called the Roundtable Groups. But within the inner vehicle, you have the Knights of Malta, which control both the financial institutions in Switzerland, and then they also control the uh, organized crime families, like the godfather of Italy. Uh, so you have the Knights of Malta, and then you also have the Knights of Columbus. Um, so the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus are two uh, working tools, or the main working tools for the core of the cabal, which are the Jesuits, the Jesuits, the Jesuits priest. Um, now, as to why they call themselves the Jesuits, that was a name that was given to them by their founder, Ignatius de Loyola, back in 1501, when he, you know, when he decided to organize the Society of Jesuits to counterattack or counteract the Reformation, the Renaissance, and the Scientific Revolution. But the whole point is this, that the great pope is actually the most powerful man because he controls all the organized crime families, right? Not to mention he, he's also at the pinnacle of the Zionist, Kazarian, Mafia, whatever you want to call it. Um, and in turn, in terms of, of, of investing in corporations, um, he is the largest shareholder. We're talking about PEPE. -E. I don't want to mention his first name. Um, the Great Pope. He is the largest strongholder, both 
at the pinnacle of the vanguard, maybe I shouldn't say it, and BlackRock, okay? So, um, yeah, he's, he's a very powerful guy. And then the second part of your question is as, well, anyways, just to let you guys know that the Earth Alliance did do away with the, the Grey Pope as well as with the Black Pope. The Jesuit Supreme General, who was second man in power, right? The Grey Pope was at the top. Um, they have all been dealt with, all right? So what we're seeing right now is just their AI duplicates that was generated by the Red Queen, which is another subject that I will explain in another live. But anyways, so uh, the second part of your question is, as star seeds, light workers, how far out do we affect humans around us? Well, due to the fact that we come in with a higher influx of resonating signature, right, resonating energy, um, our energy field is, if we are vib vibing high, because of the fact that we do um, vibrate at a hertz beyond the 70 range or beyond the 100 range, because most people vibrate anywhere from 70 hertz to about 100 hertz, but we have the potential to vibrate anywhere from 300 hertz or 200 hertz to all the way to 1,000 or even 1,500 hertz, all right? Because of the fact that we carry a higher light quotient within our bodies or within our energy vehicles, which is um, our chakra systems, right? Again, the reason we have 12 chakras is because we have 12 subtle bodies. Everything correlates. So because you generate a higher influx uh, or exert a higher energy influx than the average earth, earth Terran, you're able to affect um, in a room of earth Terrans, you're able to affect up to a few hundred uh, energy signatures. So your, your signature as an old soul with a higher light quotient is able to affect a room of a few hundred people or is the equivalent of all of their signatures combined, in other words. It could be a thousand. I'm not sure. But, you know, when you think about it, you know, out of the millions of volunteers that are down here, right, there's I think over 80, 80 million now. It's getting close to 80 million. We have the ability to shift the entire energy of all the ascending Earth terrors like this with our high influx of energy. And then the second part of your question is, see you at the expo. Nice, Ricky Lee, I will see you there. So um, do we have another chat? Let's see. So I'm just gonna continue answering random questions. I wanna welcome all 752 people that are in the house. Thank you for being here, you guys are awesome. Yes, my dog is here. My dog is always here, guys. You know, I, it's not like I, I, I allow people to, you know, take my dog for the day or two. No, no, she lives here. She's always going to be here. Uh, she's actually sleeping right now. So, um, which is a good thing. Other guys, otherwise, you guys would be hearing her little, you know, necklace for, um, uh, shackle and her paws on the floor. But yeah, she's here. Randy Hobbs says that his Reiki master teacher boldly announced that he is a super soldier. No reference to this subject. I was brought up before the revelation. Randy Hobbs, welcome, welcome. You know, that's another thing I wanted to mention is that there is no coincidence that the super soldier programs were initiated around the same time that we began to have an influx of what? Of, of star seeds coming into the earth. Isn't that interesting, right? They always want to use the most advanced genetics when it comes to the enhancements and augmentation of human, um, you know, 3.0 potential. So, Stuart Williams, thank you, brother. You've answered all of my questions. Oh, I've already addressed that. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, anybody else? Teresa McIntyre is saying, I've been trying to communicate with the sun. I'm seeing the sun's aura last time. It was shining. Really? Well, that's awesome. That is great. Okay. For those that are intending or, or those that are trying to establish uh, a relationship with the elements and the sun, this is the best time to do it. You know, it only takes a few minutes a day to develop that rapport with the living organic planet and, of course, our sun. Remember, our sun is alive. It's, it's intelligent. It's sentient. All right, we do live in a sentient universe, guys. It's all alive. All right, 
Galaxies are the organs. They're the living organs of universes. And then in turn, universes are, are also cells or organs within the body of the motherverse, which is the central universe. All right, so Radiant Guardians is asking me, oops, did I lose it? Chat's going so fast. Let's see if I could. Um, okay, so you had a very good question, by the way, Radiant Guardian. So let me go ahead and see if I could find it. Oh, thank you, Cosmic Goddess, for the other super chat and thanking me for all the live videos and the information that I share. It's an honor, guys. It's an honor to serve. But overall, I always encourage you guys to also do your own research and always approach everything with discernment. I don't expect you guys to believe everything I talk about, by the way. I just share. I just present what I know. That's it. It's like I'm a cup. I was filled with, uh, you know, filled with knowledge, and I want to make sure I... Uh, give it to you guys so that I could get more. But you guys should also do your own research, okay? <laughs> All right, so Radiant Guardians, I lost your question, but... Um... All right, sorry about that, sister. Okay, so this is a good a good one from Shakina Glory 1111. Shout out to Shakina Glory 1111. She says, "You mentioned that there are two other secret emerald tablets taken from Thoth, not corrupted." That's that's true. That's true. Out of the 12 CDT plates, Thoth only took 10. All right? The the Emerald Order, the, the Guardian Alliance decided to preserve the other two. Um, where are they now? That's a very good question. Now and when revealed by whom? Okay, so from what I understand is they were taken back to Sirius B, the, where the origin of the Anuhasi race came from. So they were taken back to Sirius B, and it is my belief that those records um, are going to be restored upon the ascension of the earth. So that's what I believe. That's what I've been feeling too. But again, you know, do your own research, go within yourself, always go within yourself, guys, believe it or not. A lot of these answers that we all have, if you learn how to quiet this thing in here, right, you could actually access on your own. Because all of those memories, all right, we don't need Akashic Records, think about it, all of those memories are stored within your genetic makeup. They're all within your genes, Thank you, Stanley Harmon, for your donation. Thank you, thank you. I want to welcome Lori May. Lori May, I met over in um, in Colorado. She's one of the galactic Jedi's from Colorado. Shout out to Lori May. How you doing, sister? Sandra says, <laughs> "Explain Kundalini, please." Okay, so. Instead of using the word serpent, I want to use the word liquid light. There you go. All kundalini energy is, is, is based on the idea that within our the base of our spine, like a slinky, there is liquid light. The liquid light that if we learn how to raise it up our spine, right, through the activation of the seven wheels, the seven chakras, we actually begin the integration process with our energy bodies, which is the beginning of our power. That's how these ancient wizards and sorcerers were able to do, either for good or for bad, were able to do what they did because they were raising the kundalini energy up their centers. So I want to call it liquid light. All right? Liquid light. I don't want to call it the serpent energy. Some traditions call it serpent fire because, you know, it's a metaphor, right? Because just like the two helixes of DNA like that. Well, they look like two serpents moving up. So I think that's the reason why some scholars decided to use the word serpent energy going up your spine. But it's really concentrated 
uh, unlimited potential of liquid a liquid light that exists at the base of your spine. You guys heard of the concept of uh, spinal cerebral uh, spinal cere it's called cerebral spinal fluid, right? Cerebral, I think it's called spinal cerebral spinal fluid. Anyways, there's another uh, terminology describing that we do have the potential, right? If we activate that base, that liquid potential, unlimited liquid potential at the base of our spine, we have the ability to raise that up our spine, causing the activation of the seven chakras, which is symbolic to the three vertebrae, right? The the the, uh, the spine. So the spine has uh, supposedly, according to the secret knowledge, has three 33 vertebrae, and that's another metaphor that was adopted by you know a lot of the secret societies to describe the activation of the light bodies of the subtle energy vehicles, which allowed man to manifest supernatural abilities. Okay. Now, let's see. <laughs> I want to welcome Lauren Ann Brown. She says she is a retired clairvoyant, astrologer, galactic astrology, and teacher. Nice. Thank you for being here, Laurel. Oh, this is a good one. Randy Hobbs is asking... Where is Nibiru now? Nibiru, okay, so it has been programmed by the Syrian High Council from the beginning to come into our system every 4,000, uh, I think it's every 4,600 years, right? 4,600 years. So it is believed that, uh, oh, 3,600 years, I'm sorry, 3,600 3, years. It is believed that it is on its way back to our solar system. In fact, there has been some images going around uh, that people have captured that we have two suns. Well, the other one is slightly a smaller sun, all right? Scientists call it nemesis. They say that our star system is part of a binary star system. Well, the other star is known as Nibiru. And it's not a star, it's really... A planetoid. It is a Battlestar planet, pretty much. It's navigated. It's like a giant spaceship. So it is currently uh, heading back into our solar system. And again, there is evidence that people have been waking up to seeing two suns in the morning. So the second sun is the Nibiri sun that is returning. And no, guys, it's not going to whack us and cause you know catastrophic events. It's not. That's not going to happen. It's actually being piloted by the Restore Niberian Council, all right? So it's 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 just going to like probably enter our solar system, but it's not going to be too close to the Earth. And many people believe that once it gets inside our solar system, um, that's what's going to actually help trigger the Great Solar Flash. So, you know, there's a lot of speculation around the return of Nibiru. But uh, unlike in ancient times, uh, Nibiru is not going to whack us it's not going to be you know a disastrous event when it does come into our solar system All right, so again, Michelle Michelle Gosnell is asking if I think that the flash is going to happen between March and May. Um, it could happen any day. It could happen any time. Um, we don't know. I don't know. But I, I do have a strong feeling that it will happen in 2024. But that's just my strong feeling. <clears throat> Sandra saying, Odin Project. So Project Odin was a white hat um, operation design, um, or it goes hand in hand with the uh, development and uh, infrastructure of Star uh, Starlink. Um, it is designed to take over the entire mass media, televisions, the airwaves, uh, everything, radio. You know, it's going to shut off the internet. All our phones are going to shut off and it's just going to 
take over the airwaves as far as radio and television is concerned. So Project Oding is the White Hat's covert operation to pretty much take over the airwaves and begin the announcements of what's been happening. So that's what Project Odin is. And it, it's very, very tied into the Starlight uh, systems or satellites. Starlink, not Starlight, sorry, Starlink satellites. So we could say that e Elon Musk, yes, was one of the um, developers in the Odin project, we could say. So this is a good question from Marilyn, from Marilyn Norton. Marilyn is asking if, if we're ever going to see the real Bible. Um, well, when it, it, when you consider that they left out over six or 700 books, um, at that point, once we activate the dormant DNA, all of that knowledge is already going to be within our genetics. So it's already going to be coming forth to our, our consciousness. In other words, we're going to begin to remember. So we won't need to read the other 700 books that were left out of the Bible. We won't need to. Because all of a sudden, all of our memories and all of our inner standing is going to return to us. So AMZ Entertainment is asking me, after the 1,000 years of peace, can we die on the final battle with AI? Is that what you asked? Um, no, we're not. We're, we're, we're going to, okay, put it this way. By the end of the millennium, guys, we're going to be so powerful that we're going to be indestructible. Put it that way. So we were designed to defeat the AI God and his minions. It's, it's going to be a battle. It's not going to be an easy battle, but we were meant to defeat them. Just know that. But at the same time, I do know that some of us are going to be using our full genetic material 100%. All right. I, I believe that after 50%, we begin to uh, use the gene of immortality, which means we are indestructible. All of a sudden, our body becomes... Uh, like that, like like that of a you know of an immortal, you could say, right? Where you activate the adamantian particles, right? <laughs> right? Like in Wolverine, right? Wolverine was kind of indestructible, right? His body was made into like some sort of metallic-like substance. But it, it's just to give you a metaphor, you know, our bodies are going to be indestructible. Now I can't get to the second part of your question because I lost it. The chat's going so fast, so I'm just going to continue here. Oh, Michelle, Michelle James, thank you so much for your donation and for the number three, three for the Trinity, right? Mind, body, and spirit, father, mother, God, father, God, mother, God, child. All right. So your question is, would it be okay to book a flights get in June? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm concerned it, it would fall if the solar, no, no, no. Um, the way I see it is when the solar flash happens, there's going to be divine protection an intervention by the intergalactic alliance or what we call the guardian races. So that's what's going to be happening. You know, there's going to be a lot of divine intervention. Teresa McIntyre is asking me if the Anubis and Thor were the same entity I don't think so because um, I, I tend to believe that Thor, according to Norse mythology, is likened to Zeus, according to Greek mythology, right? They both have the thunderbolt. They both control electricity, the thunderbolt god, right? Um, they both uh, are supposedly the guardians of the earth, right? Part of the ninth district. Well, in terms of of Thor, it's called the Ninth Realm, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny because we're part of the Ninth District in our galaxy. And yet, when you watch the movie Thor, they talk about the protection of the Nine Realms, right? 
Anaheim, Eisenhower, or something like that. Uname, I don't know. I don't know the names of the nine realms, but watch the movie Thor, right? There's disclosure there. The nine rounds, right? We're part of the ninth district in our galaxy. It's funny how they just switch names around. But I've always tend to believe that Thor and Suze are one of the same, okay? And um, that's my personal belief. And Loki, the half-brother of Thor, corresponds to Enki, Poseidon, the half-brother of Zeus. I want to shout out to my friend, John. John, who goes by jo Josha uh, Hypnoa. Thank you for being here, brother. And thank you for um, always reposting my stuff uh, on your Instagram. I appreciate that, brother. I guess I'm going to have to, you know, I'm trying to read some of these questions, but the, the chat is going so fast, I lose them. <laughs> then there's no way to rewind on my phone. Okay, so I, somebody was asking me about their dad. Their dad has two weeks to live. I think that's what they were referring to. The best thing to do, by the way, is to just spend a lot of time with your father. If your father is passing away or transitioning, I hate to use the word passing, right? There is no such thing as death. If your father is transitioning in the next two weeks, spend a lot of time with him, okay? And let him know that you will see him again soon. Tell him about the ascension or the planetary ascension. Tell him about, um, you know, tell him about the things that you've learned, you know? Tell him about breaking away from the matrix. Tell him about spirituality. Um, so just talk to him. Talk to your dad. I'm sure by now he'll understand. So Chastine Rose is saying that there are many orbs orbs around me, right? So I have a lot of orbs. That's a good thing, right? The angels are here. And then Stanley Harmon, thank you so much for the uh, super chat. Let's see. Yes, Radiant Guardian says, always do your own research, guys. The information is out there. That is so correct. You know, we are living in the age of information. There's a reason why after 20, after the year 2000, all of a sudden they started talking about the age of information, which corresponds with the rise of what? The internet. That is what emerged. That is what gave rise to the age of information. Think about it. All right? Ever since they, the internet was available to the public, our collective knowledge has skyrocketed, guys. Because now we're capable of just going online and researching anything, accessing any records we want. So knowledge is a choice, all right? Ignorance is a choice. So I hope you guys always choose knowledge over ignorance. You could tell. You could say that I took advantage of that, right? As soon as the internet came out, I was researching everything. I was like a sponge hungry for knowledge. I'm looking for questions again, just random questions. Well, this was a was Anubis and Thor the same? Oh, I've already answered that. There we go. It's called cerebral spinal fluid. I called it. So what did I call it? Spinal fluid cerebral? <laughs> I got it backwards, right? I might have a little bit of dyslexia. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much for your donation. Batch, Batch Meg. Hopefully I'm, I'm pronouncing your name right. Batch Meg Bavu. Batch Meg Bavu. Thank you, sister, for being here. I'm just going to call you Galactic Jedi. I don't know. Brother, sister, Galactic Jedi. Thank you for being here.
Yes, please rock the like, subscribe and share. Thank you for pointing that out, Radiant Guardians. It helps the channel grow, by the way, when you guys do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this is a good one from Robert Jira, Jira, J-I-R-A-U, Jira. My brother Robert is asking, please expand on the ones present now on planet Earth with 12, 24, 36, or 48 DNA potential and the morphogenetic result to restore 5D Terra. Great book, great knowledge. Thank you, brother. Okay, so as I speak, some of us, um, we're born with a 12 genetic blueprint template or 12 strands. Some of us were born with 24. Other of us were born with 40, 36. And then some of us were born with 48, which represents the different harmonic universes, right? In harmonic universe two, we use 12 strands of DNA. Harmonic universe three, we use 24. Harmonic universe four, we use 36. And harmonic universe five, we use 48. So basically, um, there are a group of us, like I said before, from coming from one of the four harmonic universes, because we're in harmonic universe one. So they're coming from one of the four harmonic universes that are above us, uh, that are carriers of these blueprints, all right, that are carriers of these blueprints in order to connect us back with all the realms, all the way to the 12th dimension and beyond. And so that's what that means. Now, you also wanted me to talk about the, the morphogenetic field that kept the blueprint of the exploding planet or civilization of Terra. Well, what if I make a correlation between the exploded planet Terra, right, Earth in the fifth dimension, right, and planet Avion, which is Earth in the eighth dimension? Think about it. So if all of a sudden the first humans appeared in our universe in Lyra, that tells us that this planet was the first that first existed in Lyra before it fell into harmonic universe one, dimensions one, two, and three, right? Before it became what it is today. So in its highest dimension, we could say that the earthlings, or we could say that uh, Terra is Avion. Okay, so when the physical aspect of Avion was destroyed, the morphogenetic field held its blueprint. And so that's why it's all it's it's going to be restored upon the solar flash. And many believe that the you could say the construct of Terra is already um, coming back together because of what we are doing down here on the earth. So as we shift into the fifth dimensional earth, that's going to be Terra. <laughs> it's going to be the fifth dimensional version of the earth that is coexisting simultaneous with this 3D earth. Right, and that is what uh, Dolores Cannons refers to as the spiritual Earth. Well, the spiritual Earth has always been there in its morphogenetic blueprint, by the way. But now, because of the grid work that we've done here on this planet, um, it is believed that the Terra Earth has been fully reconstructed, so it's already coexisting with us. So all we're waiting for is for the what? For the halls of Amenti, right? The twelve uh, major stargates to open up, and then we, you know the interdimensional ascension doorway once again becomes opened in other words Well, the bifurcation of timeline is already happening, by the way. Yes, the different parallel Earth realities are, as I speak, in convergence right now. Into only, It's going to snap into only three first, right, for the millennium. I'm looking for questions. I'm just going to scroll all the way down. Maybe I have some new questions. <clears throat> 
No, no, no. Somebody's Neil Lemoria is asking, did the military industrial complex collect the Stargates? Uh, they tried. They tried. You mean the cabal, right? They tried. But luckily, the guardians, the interdimensional uh, council of guardians were able to block them from accessing those 12 Stargates. But I do know what? I do know that the Stargates, that the 12th Stargate is Ka Kauai, right? It's Kauai. Oh, and by the way, guys, um, we're going to be doing this Friday in two days at, I think, around 5 o'clock Pacific time, which is, what, 8 o'clock Eastern. I'm going to be doing a joint live with Kristen Lee from Arcana Shores. So we're going to be broadcasting on both platforms. She's actually going to read some cards when it comes to, um, you know, these deep questions as to who was good at, in, in terms of the Anunnaki, Anki or Enlil. Uh, I had a conversation with her over the phone, and she definitely, every time she pulls cards on Enki, when she asks, you know, is Enki good, uh, the cards say no. The cards always tell her that Enki is the great deceiver, right, the the, the evil brother. So, and among other things, you know, it's, it's going to go deep. We're going to pull some cards on the Ascension. We're going to pull some cards on the EBS. When it's all this going to happen, see what the cards say. I don't know if you guys believe in Tarot, but Kristen Lee is going to be, using her cards to confirm a lot of the stuff that I believe is going to be happening on the, you know, sometime this year. So stay tuned for that live, by the way. And then also Saturday, Saturday, I'm going to do my first, uh, I want to say, uh, okay. So if you guys are up for it, okay. If you guys are up for it, I'm willing to do my first three hour live. So I'm going to have to start at 5, a little earlier than 6, right? So that would be, what, 8 o'clock Eastern time. So that way we could go over a lot of information and I could answer as many questions as I can. So on Saturday night, I'm going to give you guys three of my hours, all right? Because I love hanging out with you guys. You guys are awesome. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start a meditation to wrap tonight up. It has been an honor to hang out with you guys here today. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I want to honor 786 or 96 people in the house. Thank you so much for being here. So let's go ahead and begin to clear our mind so that we can get into the zone, guys. Come on, let's 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 collectively use our mystical wizard powers and affect the field for good, right? Let's all bring in heaven on earth. Ready? So let's breathe in with our nose. And exhale with our mouth. Breathe in with our nose. And exhale with our mouth. All right, so... I want you guys to take your consciousness out of your mind, out of your head, and merge it with everything around you. In other words, see yourself as if you're in a living room, see yourself as the couch, the, you know, whatever furniture is around, the television set, the computer in front of you, your, if, whether you're watching from a laptop or your phone, and just like merge with everything in that room. Or if you're outside, merge with everything in your yard. Now, I want you guys to also begin to see yourself expanding to your entire city. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to connect our minds together as a unifield. So let's expand to our entire city. So now you pretend your consciousness is per permeating the entire city or, or town or where, wherever it might be. And now we are going to expand it to our entire state. 
And then if you live in U in uh, the UK, um, I would say your entire uh, your entire country, because I know some of those countries are small. So if you live in the UK, the entire you know uh, UK. Uh, if you're living in Spain, expand your mind to all of Spain. If you're living in France, if you're living in Canada, whatever district or I don't know if Canada has states, but expand your mind. If you're living in South Africa, expand your mind to your entire state. And now to the entire country. So all the all the galactic Jedi's that are in the states, we are all connected now because we've expanded our mind to the entire country. So all the galactic Jedi's in the European hemisphere are connected because they expanded their mind to the entire continent, including Russia and all the galactic Jedi's in Africa and the entire continent of Africa have united all the galactic Jedi's in Canada. And that includes Alaska um, in Japan, China and all the Asian countries. Uh, India, all the galactic Jedi's in India, um, the Middle East, it's all connected as one consciousness, South America, Latin America, Mexico included. And then now let's all bridge. Let's all connect as one planetary mind. And together, let's invoke the energies of source into this planet. Let's anchor in and integrate source energy through our collective planetary mind and anchor it into this planet now. So let's all do that. See the energy go down from your chakras out of your root chakra and into the planetary core. Okay. So we're bringing in source energy in order to speed up the solar flash because we are ready. So we're all being anchor points of source energy at this time, right? As we are one planetary unimind. And let's all visualize together a world of peace, abundance, freedom, laughter, cooperation, and beauty. <sighs> So what we're doing now is we're affecting the quantum field because we're all visualizing this together. All seven, eight hundred people and everyone that watches this. <sighs> we are all together bringing heaven on earth at this time. And we decree it. Now let's visualize all the evil just dissipating, you know, all the evil just vanishing away, um, vaporizing, transmuting, leaving the earth field. So let's visualize evil just vanishing and see planet Earth as a radiant ball of light shining across the entire multiverse so now it's just radiating light no more evil no more darkness Now, if you guys would like to uh, continue holding on to that image and feeling for the rest of the night, or at least for another 30 minutes, feel free. The entire earth is illuminating, full of light. There is no more darkness. It's shining across the multiverse. And with that in mind, may the God force be with you guys. We'll see you Friday at 5 o'clock Pacific time, right? Bro double broadcasting with Kristen Lee. And we will also see you on Saturday night. We'll talk to you guys then.